All right. Is that the right slide, Joe? This is the right slide. Yeah. Okay. All right, we'll get started. Uh, can I get a scribe for this talk? Someone to, to take notes on this, that we would like to have the rest of the community get summaries before the papers get published. Or Nobody's feeling guilty at all here? Or who can I guilt? You'll do it? Okay, thanks, Rob. Yeah, go ahead. So, uh, my name is John Malloy. Uh, I'm working at the telco vendor. Oh, sorry, sorry. Okay. Yeah, my name is John Malloy. I'm talking at, working at uh, telco vendor Ericsson, and I'm going to talk about a new feature that was added to uh, the Tipsy service uh, a few months ago to Linux. Uh, so um, I think we need to go back here. Yeah. And we call it uh, Tipsy Communication Groups. And to understand this whole thing, we need to uh, have some background. Uh, uh, first, Tipsy supports two messaging modes. It's, it's uh, connection-oriented messaging, much like we know it from TCP, uh, with slightly different, uh, uh, slightly different properties. Uh, but that is not the subject of this talk. And the second uh, messaging mode is uh, datagram messaging. Also somewhat what we know with from UDP, but also with different properties. Uh, what is different is, and specific in Tipsy is that unicast messaging uh, or datagram messaging can be done in two different or several different ways and with different addresses. We have two address types. We have a socket, uh, socket address, which uh, not very surprisingly consists of a, a port number and a, a node number, as you will see from the left here. That is something you get from the system when you create the socket. And with that, you can send unicast messages to one specific socket. It, this address uniquely identifies the socket. The second address type is what we call a service address. You address services. You don't know where the service is, you just use this address. And this consists also of two integers, a type identifier and an instance service type identifier and an instance identifier. Both set chosen by the user by the program when he's uh, writing his program. And with this type of address, you can uh, uh, send messages, uh, distribute messages in two different ways. You can use what we call anycost, that is you send a message as a client sends a message and it will be delivered to any of the sockets if there's more than one that is bound to this particular address. In this example here, you'll see there are two bound to the same address. And uh, this selection is done on a round robin basis. So, so this message, one sender sending several messages, they will not go to the same destination. You can also use this same message type to um, use to send multicast messages. That is, you can choose that the messages arrive or are delivered to all sockets who are bound to this particular uh, address. Now, of course, there is a problem with this, as it always is with datagram messaging. You are not guaranteed that the message will be delivered uh, because there is no end-to-end -end flow control. Uh, chances are much better to have it delivered here than where you have an UDP because there is, after all, a delivery guarantee node-to-node. -node. There is a so-called link layer in Tipsy that will deliver the packets and the messages node-to-node. -node. But once they are, have arrived, at, even when they have arrived at the, at the destination socket, they may still be tossed away, simply because uh, the destination buffer is overfull. So this is one problem. The second problem is related to the other major or service that Tipsy is delivering, what we call service tracking. And that is related to the same addressing type, the service address. It is possible for, uh, for um, a client to subscribe for all binding and unbinding events uh, to this uh, particular address or address range. If you look at the left hand side, the client here has created a socket and he subscribed for service type number 42 and he wants to know about all bindings within the instance range 0 to 10. 
And then you see to the, on the right-hand side, there are two services binding to, uh, to instances within that range. So the client will receive uh, events about this, and they will receive both the socket addresses that have been, are being used, both the bound to service address and the socket address that belongs to the socket. Now, there is a problem with this approach too. That is that the socket the client, the socket the client is using for this for this uh, subscription is a connection-oriented socket. He connects to a dedicated internal topology service in Tipsy. So this socket cannot be used for traffic, for sending message, other messages. That also means that the events and the message will follow different paths, and there is no synchronization between these two. So that also means it's fully possible for a client process to sending out a message it will end up in a service that this doesn't yet know about. The server, may, the server may respond, and he will actually, surprise, surprise, receive messages from, from a server he doesn't learn, hasn't learned about yet. The opposite may also happen. The client may receive an event about the crash or an unbinding of one of the servers, where after he may actually receive a message from that server, which has been lagging somewhere in a queue somewhere. So uh, this is a problem that may cause surprises for the programmers, and they will have to deal with it, which is not necessarily easy. So the solution to this, which we came up with, this is what we call communication groups. Uh, we can in initially think about it as multicast groups, because this is how the idea came up, and this is how we started out with it. Uh, the basic idea is that each socket keeps track, needs to keep continuous track of all other members of this group. A socket joins a group by a, I call it a join call here, but it's in reality a set socket, where he, he indicates a tuple, a group, and a member tuple, two, in, two integers. And this is distributed via the distributed, internal distributed binding table in Tipsy to all the other sockets in that group. Um, so all sockets continuously knows about all other sockets in the group, and this makes, it, makes a lot of things possible, which we'll see later. Of course, if the socket knows about all the other members, maybe the user could learn about it also, and that is also possible here. Uh, so the user, he can choose to subscribe for new members and for members disappearing, and he will receive an event about it. And this event is nothing magic, it's just an empty message, an out-of-band message, which he will receive, which contains information about, is accompanied with the information about the two source addresses of the new member, or the, or the disappeared member. I should also mention here that when I say group and member here, it's nothing but what I call a service address in the previous slides. It's really a type and an instance address uh, but in this context, we find it convenient to call it something else. So, uh, uh, because of this, it's possible for the user and for the sockets to keep continuous track of the, it, its other members. And the fact that the group, group is closed, you will never receive, be able to exchange, one member will never be able to exchange messages with, uh, with the sockets outside the group. That makes it possible to introduce, for instance, flow control, which you'll see later. Uh, now, once we have established this, this concept, we realize, yeah, but this can be used for more things. We can actually do this for the unicast feature we described earlier, that datagram unicast. It can be used for the anicast feature we described earlier, for the multicast, what was a, which was a problem we started to try to solve. And a new messaging mode comes up here broadcast, group broadcast. That means you can actually send this a message to all members of the group, irrespective of the, mem the member's uh, number, member ID. You just use the, the basic send primitive, which are all used to from TCP, for instance. And uh, the message will be delivered to all members, irrespective. And when you receive one of these messages, it's just like in the previous slide, when you received events, in this case, you received a message with data and a company with the two source addresses of the, of the, 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 the message. So, 
uh, to summarize so far, we have established what we call communication groups. The user can create its own group, which means it can actually create uh, its own private instances of a brokerless message bus, but very low level at the socket level. It will have the same addressing properties as I described earlier, <coughs> as, and as we are used to be tipsy for those who know it, but it will have very different traffic properties, which I will come back to. It will be possible to avoid ever losing any messages. And we have these four distribution methods I mentioned. Sequence order and delivery can be guaranteed, and even between the different, met different even distribution methods, which I'll come back to. That was a tricky problem. And what is more, we can leverage L2 broadcast and UDP multicast when we see that as favorable, when we are sending broadcast and multicast in the group. Um, so this makes it possible to introduce end-to-end -end flow control and socket-to-socket -socket flow control. And this means never, messages will never be dropped because of destination buffer overflow. We can use this mechanism both for multicast, broadcast, unicast, anycast, all the distribution methods. Uh, for point-to-point -point and point-to-multipoint, we use just a regular sliding window algorithm. It's nothing magic with that. For the more tricky problem with multi-point-to-point, which I've actually also solved, we use a, li a li little more elaborate method. It's still a sliding window, but a little smarter. Uh, so, group unicast, I think I've already said what I needed to say about that, so I'll just skip that slide. Group Anycost uh, also mentioned that. Uh, there are two more things to add here. The first thing is that apart from a round-robin algorithm selecting between the members here, the two members, 28, as you'll see here, uh, the sender will actually also look at the advertised window, since we have flow control now. He will look, look at the advertised window from his selected destination. And if he finds that that window is too small, he will look further until he finds one, hopefully, which has a big enough window and it will send a, window, send a message to that destination. So this way we have actually achieved a simple but powerful load balancing at the socket level. Of course, it may happen that you uh, don't find anybody with enough window to send a message. And then, uh, as you would expect, uh, the socket will block or it will return E again until one of the members receive enough window. Uh, another thing to mention here is that any socket, a sender socket, can make itself eligible for, for receiving its own messages. It's what we call a loopback option. So uh, if this member to the left, the sending member who has member ID 60 here, if it instead had member ID 28 as the two others to the right, he would receive his own share of his, uh, and he has set this option, he would receive, uh, receive his own share of his uh, anti-cost messages. The same goes for multicast. He can make himself eligible for receiving loopback, otherwise there's nothing more to add here, and for broadcast. He, can, he, will, he will send it out, and he can make himself eligible for it. Now, for the rest of this presentation, to understand the rest of this presentation, we need some more background here. And that is that in Tipsy, we have traditionally a way of, of distributing reliable broadcast between nodes, and once again, not between sockets, but between nodes, using what we call a broadcast link. So you actually... You can send a message leveraging using L2 on Ethernet broadcast, or you can use UDP multicast. And the message will, as you will see on the left-hand side here, deliver to all nodes indiscriminately. All, the blue dots here are nodes in this case. They are not sockets. And the message will be delivered by the switch or the switch infrastructure to all nodes in the whole cluster. This, of course, may be a little wasteful. If you look at the red dots here, which actually which represent the actual destinations, uh, the, uh, those are sockets. And you see here, you have 20 nodes, and the message is delivered to all these nodes, although there are only four actual destinations distributed uh, across three nodes. So in this case, the sender can try to be smarter. He can identify that, yeah, there is actually only three destination nodes here. 
So let me send this message as discrete messages to these nodes instead and let the node internally distribute it to its sockets. So that is possible to do. And there are two reasons for wanting this. The one is eff perceived efficiency of using bandwidth and using CPU power. The other one is that some infrastructures nowadays actually don't, simply don't allow multicast to be used in the cloud, for instance, some infrastructures. So you can choose. Then the, the problem arises if you want on the fly, for instance, if a new member comes up so that you, that triggers the, the selection algorithm, algorithm selection algorithm, to say it's put it that way, to switch method, switch algorithm, uh, then this message will pass through different data paths and there is a risk of, of uh, the message being delivered in, out of order. So we have to deal with that problem and we have done that. And that is what we are doing on this slide, showing on this slide. So uh, each, uh, each broadcast ever sent out uh, is, contains a sequence number, and each member keeps track of which was the last sequence, broadcast sequence number it received from a certain socket. Uh, so because of this, when you receive a broadcast out of order because you have switched algorithm, each receiving node will track this. It receives maybe n and it was n plus one and it was expecting message number n. It will put it into a reordering queue and wait until the missing broadcast arrives and it will rearrange it and deliver it in, in order. So that problem is solved. Uh, also, unicast sequentiality guarantee, and that covers also any cost, because that is at the link level, at the lower levels, implemented as unicast. Uh, here, we don't need to do anything, because that is already taken care of at the link layer, inclusive delivery up to the socket layer. So that comes by, come for free with the already existing TIPS infrastructure. Uh, then comes a more tricky problem. Uh, what if I first send a unicast and then send a broadcast? How do I guarantee that this broadcast is delivered to a particular node? If you look at message number one here, and, and a, which is a unicast, and message number two, which is a broadcast, how do I guarantee that this node, this socket number 28, member 28, uh, I, receives message number two after message number one? And the trick here is we leverage this replicast replicated broadcast method I present, presented earlier. So the sender socket will keep track of what, was the, what type of message was the previous message, message I sent. So when somebody is trying to send a broadcast in the, in the second pic, 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 picture here, he realizes, okay, the previous one was a unicast. So I should send this as a replicated unicast. And these messages, all, even the message to number 28, will follow the same data path as uh, as the others, as the unicos. So th this way, there is no risk of any reordering. Now comes, this, comes the next problem. Yes, but we, it's solved for the first message, but we, we don't want to continue being forced to continue having to send broadcasts as replicated unicasts for the, for the future. We want at some moment to be able to change, to switch freely. And then we have solved that in such a way that we let these replicate the replicated broadcasts, they contain a bit, each, each packet contain, or message contains a bit saying, I want an acknowledge when you have received this. So each, the sender will actually stop and wait for all these acknowledges from all, the, all its known destinations. And when he has received that, he can go on sending other broadcasts. And at that moment, he is free to choose broadcast algorithm as he wants, either as true broadcast, multicast, or as replicated broadcast. Then comes the next problem, which is the opposite and different and much more likely to happen, actually. What if I send a broadcast, a uh, sender sends a broadcast, and thereafter sends a unicast? How do I guarantee that that unicast does not bypass the broadcast and is delivered before the broadcast? 
especially since unit costs, as we saw in some previous slide, don't necessarily, or they don't contain their own sequence number because they don't have to. The solution to that is also, it's actually simple. You let the unit cost contain the, broad, the sequence number of the previously sent broadcast. So when this second unit cost on the right hand side is sent, the receiver will, re will realize, okay, I received number, a unit cost here that is telling me that the, pre the preceding broadcast was number n plus one. But I have actually only received number n. So it will put the unit cost into its reordering queue, wait for the missing broadcast, and when that arrives, it will reorder and deliver in order. So that way we have solved this problem. Uh, next problem is flow control. And there we have point to point and multi point, point to multi point. And this is quite straightforward in reality because we have. Uh, yeah, we were here. Because we have um, uh, a, a record, each socket keeps a record for all the other members. It can also keep an advert, uh, a window to that particular, to each member. And it will also keep an advertised, how much it has advertised to each other member at any moment. So when this member number 60 is sending a message, he will look at, for instance, if he's sending a broadcast, he will look at the window for that for all members and find if there's anybody who has too small window, I'll have to wait until I have more advertisement for that. Or if he's sending a unicast, he just looks at the window for that particular destination. Nothing special with that, uh, nothing magic. Uh, the next problem is a classic one and quite tricky one. What if multiple members or all members decide at the same moment to throw themselves on one particular member and send, themself, send, send a message to it? It's quite easy to overwhelm it with the messages and overwhelm the receiver from that member 28 down there. Uh, so we must not allow this to happen. We must find a, a, a reliable, secure algorithm, theoretically secure algorithm, secure algorithm that can avoid that. Um, and the, the real problem here is that you cannot let one member, if the group is big, you cannot let this, each member advertise a sufficiently reasonably large window to all the other members in the group, because then he is guaranteed to be overwhelmed at some moment. So there must be some restraint to this, some limitation. And the way we have done that, that is that we let each member set an absolute upper limit for how much it can be it allows itself to advertise combined to all the peer members. And then he makes the advertisement selectively. So he doesn't treat all other members equally. He starts out with giving them all a very small window, just as big as needed for them to send one single max size message without being blocked. Then when he receives a message from one of these members, then he will send it out a much bigger window and tell, you can continue now. So he's making the assumption that if somebody is sending you a message, it's likely that there will be more. It's more likely that he will send more messages than anybody else will do. Uh, and he keeps that in an active member list, currently active member list, and giving this, these members uh, in that list continuously more window than the others. Then, of course, you will at some moment come to a limit when you have exhausted all your, all your uh, advertisable resources. And then some new member comes in and sends you a message, somebody who has just a minimum window. And he also wants to become an active and have, big, have a big window. What, does, what do we do then? The receiver, he will, he, he will look at the list and he will look at who was the least active of the active one, who, who was the which was longest ago who sent me a message. And we'll pick that, that sender, that member, send him a reclaim message and tell, give me back some of your window that I advertised to you because you are not using it anyway. I need it for somebody else. And he will receive a message back after a short while uh, with this, new, with this uh, reimbursed advertisement and he can give it to the new guy. 
So it's a sort of scheduling algorithm. And uh, this has turned out to work well. And the only thing that will happen if you really start to overwhelm uh, too many senders will start to overwhelm a receiver with too many messages is that the whole thing will start to go a little slower. But it will never crash, it will never fail. And uh, uh, given that this is not probably not very frequent occasions, this is acceptable. So uh, one question that may arise when you hear this presentation is, what can this be used for? What is the idea with this? Uh, first of all, what we have created is, a, it's a, I would say it's a low-level broker-free message bus in its own right. So you can, by just using sockets and doing so sets of opts and send and the regular socket operations, you can do, use this as a message bus without a broker, a broker-free message bus. That's a very strong point. Uh, we do actually also have a small library on top of this to make it easier to use it, but it's no obligation to use it. And of course, we could elaborate this and create some full-fledged message bus on top of this, which is something we are considering. Another possibility is that we could, uh, we could uh, port existing message buses, like RabbitMQ, 0MQ, Thrift, etc., to Tipsy, to make use of this broker-free infrastructure. Uh, when it comes to 0MQ, it has already been ported to Tipsy. It's, it's worked with Tipsy, but we have so far not um, it's so far not taking advantage of the group messaging uh, feature here. Uh, another thing it's very useful for is keeping a very tight overview over the physical and software topology in a cluster, because you will have immediate feedback for any changes uh, up and down of nodes, of no or sockets. And if you combine this with, for instance, a consensus protocol, you may know about Paxos or Raft, uh, then I think this would be a perfect match, especially TIPS plus Raft, which is, I think is the most, most popular consensus protocol now. I think that would be a very exciting, a very interesting combination to see. So to summarize this whole thing, what is the advantage of this over other models, TCP, or uh, you can set up, a, instead of course, set up a full mesh of TCP connections, or uh, you can use TCP, TIPS connections, or you can use something else. Well, first of all, it, connects, it provides a sort of connectionless messaging flow or datagram messaging flow with flow control, I would claim, although within a closed group. But this group can be quite big. Uh, you can also have lo loss-free multicast, as I mentioned earlier, as, in, as opposed to traditional UDP multicast groups. The programming model is very simple. You have one single socket that you need to op open. And for that, you can, you can do sending, you can receiving, and you can even receive membership events in it, directly in the socket, proper. Uh, and sequentiality, cardinality is guaranteed without any effort whatsoever by the user. Then this, of course, is much more memory and resource efficient than any other options. You have one single, for instance, we know that the socket in Linux occupies around 4K quote from David Miller, I think. And uh, if you would try to f create this kind of group with a full mesh of TCP connections, you would, at each member, you would ha end up with having, it, imagine you have a group of N, N members. At each member, you would have to create N sockets. So with a N times 4K in memory, just memory consumption. And then, uh, also, the communication, the tipsy group communication itself, it needs only one socket plus one record, internal record per destination. This record is 80 bytes of size, which is a huge difference. So that's only the only memory you will occupy. Then you, of course, also about reservation. If you use TCP or tipsy connections, you will reserve a full window for each socket. In this case, you reserve a big number of the minimal window size and a much smaller number of the maximum window size for, for, uh, for uh, advertisement and for uh, receive queues. Uh, another feature here is that since I never like to use timers, those are very undeterministic in their behavior, I always look, look for, for um, uh, deterministic solutions. I have avoided timers in these solutions and it's fully possible. 
Uh, this is also a very bandwidth efficient if you look to the full mesh uh, alternative because we can use L2 broadcast or, or UDP multicast whenever we, it's possible. Uh, and it scales. We have tried this. It scales to hundreds of members without any problems. And it uh, levers, leverages all the other known TIPS advantages like service addressing. We don't know the where, know where our service is. We just use this address of our own choice. And also, we will re ha receive this immediate reception of membership events without ac any active monitoring of the peers. Uh, if you want more information, we have a homepage for Tipsy, www.tipsy.io, or just type tipsy.io, where you can find it. And we do have a project page at SourceForge. You can try. And uh, that is where you'll find all information. At the project page, you'll find uh, demos and test programs and stuff to download. And um, API demos, for instance, for Java, for Python, for, uh, for Go, etc. So that's what I had. Thank you very much. Questions? Hello. Uh, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about your failure modes when nodes disappear. For example, in the uh, case where a new node is requesting a window and you need to release the window that was owned by another node, which has, like, say it's Nick died or something, and you're going to say, OK, well, in order to give you a window, I need to get, yeah. get my window back, but then I never get a reply. So then do you have some kind of timeout? Or what, what do your failure modes look like in practice yeah, for all, that Yeah, all this is taken of care of. I, I will, don't say it's trivial, but it, all this is taken care of. So if you're sending a message and receiving an ACK, for instance, uh, and you <laughs> instead discover that that destination disappeared, that counts as an ACK. So you can release the window or set to zero. Set to zero. You remove, release, remove the whole member record for that member. And uh, how do you detect that it disappeared? Some kind of blink monitoring? This is, this, uh, as I mentioned earlier, this internal distribution or topology service. So each, each socket, each member socket is internally subscribing to this topology service and it will receive an event from this topology service that now this member disappeared. And that will happen very fast, normally, immediately. Then there is some synchronization issues to take care of, just as I mentioned in my second slides, that yes, the topology service is telling you that it disappeared, but what if a message shows up later from that one guy? That guy? And for that, I have some internal messaging also that is taken care of. So it's guaranteed, all of it. Awesome. Any more questions? Okay. No more questions. Okay. Thanks, John. John. Uh, uh.